It's the same way that when the Lord gets in us, when we experience and taste and see the goodness of who he is, he gets in our bones and we can't help but proclaim the goodness of that. And that's the hope that we cling to. That's the the way that we patiently endure even when things are hard because we know that he is coming again and we can walk forward in the strength of him. Well, good morning. Good to see you all. Morning, Gary. Good to see you as always. That seat is there just for you. So. Well, um, man, it's good to see you all. Hey, thanks. Um, my family and I had a chance to get away uh, last week and just uh, have some time together. We went up, we kept telling people, yeah, hey, we're going up to Seattle and we we're spending time in Portland. And people were like, you're going to Portland? And what are you guys doing? We're like, no, we drove through Portland and we went up to West Seattle and then down to Bend and um, just had some good time as, as a family. Um, and as we were uh, coming back uh, last Monday, driving through, we kind of just got to see the, as we're coming through Mount Shasta, just this display of, of lightning and the beauty of what that is, but also knowing what that would mean uh, for the dryness of our, our state and our season. So I just, I, I do want to spend some time this morning uh, just praying for all the different fires that are happening. I know that the Jones fire is, is, is being well contained now. And I know that was, uh, there's some scares for some of you as you were evacuated or kind of on the ready and had things ready to go. Uh, I know that there's some other fires throughout our state that uh, are just consuming homes in, in, a, in a terrible way. Um, and it's moments like these where we just, uh, we're grateful for those who step into, into those moments uh, with courage and uh, chase those things down. So, so grateful for our firefighters that are stepping in. But just wanted to take a moment uh, before we, we did anything else just to, just to pray uh, for, for rain. Uh, there's, there's talk of more th- thunderstorms and, and lightning this week, um, just that that would not create more fires, more issues, um, and just for God's uh, protection. So if you just join with me. Father, we do just want to lift up um, those who have experienced loss in the midst of uh, so many of the fires that are raging. Um, God, we, uh, we just feel the sorrow for them. And Lord, for those who are uh, stepping in and who are helping, Father, uh, would you help us to be creative in the ways that we can help? Um, Lord, for those firefighters that are risking so much, uh, God, we're so grateful for them. Would you just uh, be present with them, Father? Would they, they know you in the midst of what they are experiencing and, and facing? Father, of those who are far from you, would they uh, be drawn near to you, even in the, the face of duty? But God, we just are thankful for uh, what they are willing to do in order to serve, Father, and to protect. And so, God, we, we just ask for your hand to be over uh, all of this. We know it is, uh, God. We, we never question that. But, Lord, we do ask for just your protection, that the, the fires would, would be contained, Lord. Um, God, that you would move in miraculous ways. And, um, God, even as we look at the weather, uh, we see that there's potential for more, for more thunderstorms, more lightning. Um, God, we just ask again um, uh, that you, you would protect, uh, Father, that you would just uh, do as only you can do. And so, Lord, um, again, we just bring this before you and know that there are many, many who are... Uh, God, just so concerned and afraid of, of what they will lose. And, and God, even in the midst of that, I'm reminded of a, a friend I know who, whose house did burn down um, in, in the hills of Santa Cruz. And uh, Lord, uh, the approach that uh, he has taken in his family, that they know that while their stuff has been consumed, uh, you have them and you hold them and that you are enough. And so, Lord, I'm just uh, amazed at how you can comfort and provide even in those moments. And so, God, we ask that you would, uh, that you would move in the midst of this and make yourself known in the midst of uh, the many fires, God. Um, so, Lord, we just lift this up to you and pray for those in the front lines. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, well, just by way of reminder, uh, we are gearing up towards fall. And if you are interested in getting connected in a, a small group, uh, a, a home group, uh, a 
men's Bible study, a women's Bible study, would you let us know? We'd love to help and navigate that for you and get you hooked up where you need to go. If you're someone who's thinking, you know, maybe I want to host uh, something in, in my house or, or do something of that nature, we have ways of helping you with that as well. Um, so please let us know. We just really want to encourage you to take the relationships that happen here beyond what happens just here. That, that Sunday is, is a great start, but there's so much more for us to experience together. And so we want to make sure that you're aware of that and getting plugged in and in community here. Um, and this morning, we're going to continue in our, our study of James. Um, and some of you uh, may have noticed we were supposed to have a guest speaker uh, today, and I'm still here and I'm all mic'd up. Um, and what happened there? Uh, my good friend, uh, Pastor Steve Dang, uh, a man I've done many, many years of ministry with, uh, was supposed to be here this Sunday, and um, no one is probably more disappointed uh, than me that he's not here, um, because I just couldn't wait for you to hear from him, particularly in, in the topics that we were stepping into. Uh, but my, my good friend, um, he had a rare form of cancer, and in which case he had to have his stomach removed uh, a, a few years ago. And as a result of that, there's just still some lingering health effects that flare up from time to time. And so about midweek, um, about Wednesday night, m middle of the night, he was having some, some reflux issues that actually turned into pneumonia for him. This is something that happens. And so um, he was unable to be here. He's also just deeply disappointed. He can't wait to be up here and just to share with you. Um, but I just encourage you, as you, as you think of him, uh, be praying for, for my friend Steve um, and for his health and that he would recover. Um, but that also means that you're, you're stuck with me this morning. Um, and so, so I know, I know, I believe me, I wasn't even pandering there. I'm like, sorry, this is, this is what you get. So, um, so we're going to jump into to James uh, chapter five, uh, verse, verse seven. And so if you would, would you stand with me? And I'd like to read it together. James chapter five, verse seven. And we're going down through 11 this morning. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider the blessed, those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Father, as we look at these words this morning, uh, again, as we always pray, may they take life in us. Um, Lord, would we not just hear these, but as James has reminded us over and over again, would we embody these truths? Would we live them out? Uh, and so, God, as we talk around the idea of, of patience and endurance and steadfastness, God, would you establish us in you? Would you keep our hearts fixed on you this morning? So God, we give this time to you. We ask for you to speak and to convict and to, to move as you see fit. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You can take a seat. Well, I, uh, as I was reading this passage, it, it reminded me of one of my first lessons in, in patience. Um, as, a, as a kid, I, I was collecting those proofs of purchase on the back of the cereal boxes because I knew that if I got enough of them, there was a particular matchbox car that I could send away for. And I was so excited about this. And so I went through and collected them and I, I got the envelope all ready and I was filling out this little thing on the back of the cereal box that you had to drop in the mail to. And, and I, I remember reading through it and my, my eyes caught just kind of the fine print and it said, may take up to six weeks for delivery, right? And as a kid, that's like an eternity. I was like, six weeks. And I was like, well, that's, that's no big deal. And so I remember putting the, the envelope in the mail, and it was like immediately I forgot the six-week thing. And the next day, I'm like at the mailbox. And I'm opening it up and looking in, like, is it here yet? No, it's not here. And I did that every day. I just kept going to the mailbox expecting, like, no, it's going to come. Anytime. And I did that every day for about two weeks. And then I got bored of looking and got distracted, right? 
I was patient for a moment. I had this expectation, but then very soon I got distracted because the lesson that I learned then and have continued to learn that I haven't got too much better at is that patience is really hard. And we're, we're not good at it. We, we just have to take a look around the, the world and we recognize how, how much we demand immediately. We don't like to wait some of us are having a really hard time right now that Amazon is no longer able to deliver next day, that we're looking at like a week out and sometimes like, is that even worth getting if I can't get it until a week? <laughs> and this is, this is the, the world that we, we live in. And there's so much to distract us. There's so much that, that pulls at us. So when we're trying to be patient, when we're trying to, to continue to live in such a way as James is reminding us that we are to be congruent, the things that we say that we believe are to, to be fleshed out in our lives, that when we try to be patient as we go through this, we, we recognize we're living in a world where things are not as they are meant to be. That oftentimes things that are, are wrong are called, are, are called right. Right. That the design that God had for us to, to flourish as human beings has been thwarted by this thing of sin. And so we recognize that it's even harder to be patient with those who are around us when there seems to be competing values that go against the kingdom. It seems as though evil's winning at times. Injustice is just a, a way of life. That wrong is claimed as right. And we just feel this unsettledness. And so how can we be patient in the midst of this? And that's where James starts to bring us here in, in verse 7 of chapter 5. This really is the beginning of the end. James is starting to wind down his letter. He's starting to bring things back into focus as we're coming to a close here. See, James is, is pointing us back to this need for, for patience. If we think back to chapter one, he pointed out this idea that we should consider it joy when we experience various trials of all kinds. That the testing of your faith is a, is a good thing. He started that and now he's kind of coming back around. So be patient, continue steadfast, endure. He, he spoke to us around this idea of what happens when our desires get out of whack, when we allow our desires to trump the Lord's desires, we begin to feed those that, that we're going to pursue things that don't matter. But then he reminds us again that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights who there is no variation, no shift, no shadow in, that we're to hold tight to him that we're to be hearers and doers of the word. He hammers this over and over again, that we're not to play favorites, that we're not to show partiality. If someone's rich, we're not to take them in higher esteem. If, if someone's a different race, we're not to hold that against them. We're to see all as made in the image of God as our brothers and sisters created in his image. And as God's people, as followers of Jesus, we're to, to lead with mercy. We're to lead with love. And our faith is to be active. It's not to just be theory. It's not just to be something that lives in our heads. But there's to be works that go alongside it. Not because we're trying to earn anything. He's earned everything on our behalf. But that we get to be participants with him in his kingdom work. That we get to help bring about the goodness of what he's called us to do. That's why there's works involved. That it should just spill out of us. And we're to keep our hope established in Jesus. Not to waver from that truth. And so James has been weaving this throughout, but he knows it's easy to be distracted. It's easy to lose hope and it's easy to be disheartened with the world around us. And so that's why in verse seven, he says, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Be patient. Be patient, my brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. Now this this encouragement follows on the heels of what we looked at last week, what Pastor Ryan took us through. This indictment against those who use their, their riches to oppress and to defraud those who are helpless to defend themselves, those who establish their hearts and their, their wealth or their worth. 
Because James is writing to an audience that knows what it means to be the underdog and knows what it means to be the minority, to be on the fringe, those who are looked at as different. And so here his words are important for us. This idea to be patient means to remain tranquil while waiting. That's a hard thing to do. Or to bear up under provocation without complaint. That's what being patient means. As one author states, it says, James encourages believers to remain even-tempered through the trials and hardships they face. The verb implies more than mere endurance, but active forbearance, patience, and long-suffering. Rather than give up when things get hard, they are to remain steadfast in their faith and active for God. Active forbearance, active patience, active long-suffering. That means we are aware of the tension around us and that we are actively choosing to be patient in the midst of what's happening. But for how long are we to be patient? What does this patience look like? Well, he says, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Until the coming of the Lord. We are to be patient until the coming of the Lord, which means we either, we, we either meet him in the sky, we meet him in death, but as long as we have breath, we are to be patient. And James gives us this example. He says, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. Now, this image is one that James's audience would have known well. They understood the importance of the rains for their crops and what it meant to be a farmer. Those early rains that would come from about October to mid-November that would help to establish the crops and the seeds that had just been sown would then later be fortified by the late rains that would come about March and April and help strengthen those crops before they were harvested. See, the farmer does all that he can to prepare the land, to prepare the soil, to remove the rocks, to give it the, the opportunity for optimum growth. But then at the end of the day, once he plants the seeds, he has to, to wait. For the farmer cannot force the crop to grow. The, the farmer cannot stretch the seed into a stalk. The farmer cannot force the fruit to come. But the farmer actively waits with a patient expectation for what is to come. This image is so important that uh, James is reminding us of, and it's, it's also imagery that Jesus uses throughout where he's talking around the fields and, and the way things grow. Jesus would use this example with the seeds that are sown and the different soils that they land on. Jesus was often taking from the everyday examples of life to help people understand the way in which the kingdom was at work that we are to, to cling to him, that he is the vine and only in him can we find true life when we abide, when we rest, when we remain in him. And so the farmer awaits his precious fruit. He waits patiently. And so James says, just as the farmer is patient in verse eight, you also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Again, the means of our patience is found in knowing that the coming of the Lord is at hand. If I find myself in a, in a moment of emergency, but I know that help is on the way, I can dig a little deeper. I can hang on a little bit longer when I know that help is coming. And if I've rooted myself in the truth that I know that the Lord is returning, and this is what James is reminding us of, then we can be patient if we establish our hearts in the right truths. Now, he's not talking around establish your heart and just establish your feelings. That's not what he's getting after here. The heart, the cardia, was considered the place of the will and of your decisions that you make, meaning the things that we choose, not simply the things that we feel. Because we can feel a lot of things. 
And we can feel a lot of things in the midst of uncertainty, but we can still choose to establish our hearts in the certainty of Jesus. And this is what James is drawing us back to. He's saying, so, so be patient, establish, root, strengthen, and set your heart towards Jesus. Paul speaks about this in, in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 11. He says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he, God, may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Paul is speaking to this idea that God will establish your hearts blameless in holiness so that we may be prepared for the coming of the Lord. Always keeping that in mind, the Lord is returning. This great hope that we have, he is coming back. And we are to establish our hearts as set apart to him, holy unto him, our lives, our hearts, our his and I believe this truth is so important for each and every one of us because it's easy to establish our hearts in the wrong thing. It's easy for us to establish our hearts in, in temporary things. It's easy to establish our hearts in search of the easy fix. But when we do this, we forfeit so much. And James is reminding us to plant our faith in Christ and to trust in him, to establish ourselves in him, to root ourselves in him. Again, this is what Jesus meant when he told his disciples and, and in turn speaks to us, you are to abide in me, he said, to remain in me, to dwell in me. And when we remain in him, we can be fruitful, but apart from him, we can do nothing. But when Jesus says this, when he says, abide in me, he does not say, abide in me when it's convenient. He doesn't say, abide in me when it's easier. Abide in me when it works best for you. Abide in me and all your dreams will come true. He doesn't say any of that. He doesn't say, abide in me and you will never experience trouble. No, he doesn't, he doesn't say that at all. He simply says, abide in me, root yourself in me, dwell in me, remain in me, establish your heart in me. Because when we do this, when we establish our hearts in him, whatever comes against us cannot overcome us when we are established in him. That's the truth of what Jesus is pointing us to. This is what James is drawing back to. So, so be patient and establish your hearts. Establish your hearts for what? For the coming of the Lord is at hand. The coming of the Lord. The New Testament writers and followers of Jesus believe that the, the return of the Lord was imminent. They, they speak about it often and frequently. They believed he was coming back soon. This was their consistent message that we were to be prepared, to be ready, that when he showed up, that we wouldn't be surprised or taken off guard, but we should always be watching and waiting. This question is one that's been asked of me a little bit more uh, regularly as of late. Like, is this, is this the beginning of the, are we living in the end times? I think that question is something that's gone through most of our minds as we look around at the world around us, as we walk through some unprecedented days and we go, okay, Lord, what are you up to? Is this, is this the beginning? And here's what I can tell you with great certainty. Every day we are closer to the last days. Every day. Yeah. I know. Deep, deep thoughts. See, but what James is pushing at here, and we may say, but he was writing almost over 2,000 years ago, and he was saying it's close. That, that seems like a, a long thing, but James is reminding us that we should always be living with the end in mind, that we should always be living with that urgency that any day the Lord can return, and that we should always be ready and that we should always be assured of this hope that he is coming, that he will come and he will set all things right, that that hope is unwavering, that hope is certain. And no matter what we experience in the here and now, we can hold tight to that truth and we can endure with patience. 
So be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now, again, James isn't simply talking around the patience of of waiting for your Amazon orders to come. He's talking about patiently awaiting and enduring when all is not as it should be. He's talking about patiently awaiting and enduring when you have been praying for years for for your brother or your sister or your mom or your dad to come to know the truth of the gospel and and you plead with the Lord every day and you patiently endure saying, Lord, may they come to know you and and you see no movement and you're wondering, is this ever going to take fruition? And yet you patiently await upon the Lord and you patiently pursue and persevere. You continue forward unshaken in the Lord, established in him, drawing near to him with a patient expectation while we patiently await the coming of the Lord. James reminds us in verse nine. He says, while you're doing this, while you're being patient, while you're establishing yourself in the Lord, he tells us, verse nine, do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Have you ever had that moment where you're getting your house ready for people to come over? And you're kind of doing the last minute prep when suddenly you get a knock on the door earlier than you expected. Right? And you realize I'm not going to get done what I needed to get done. Right? James is, is talking here and he's reminding us that, that the, the Lord is at the door. That the time is, is near, that we should always be ready. So why would we waste our time grumbling and complaining and murmuring and rolling our eyes at one another? Because when we do that, what happens? James has already talked around this and how we are to treat one another. That when we stand in place as judge over our brother and sister, we're taking the place of of the judge. If you remember in in James chapter 4, verse 11, he says, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's only one lawgiver and judge. He was able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? James has already spoken of this. Now he's weaving back on this idea. He's like, don't don't grumble against each other. It's hard enough to patiently endure and now you're going to snipe at one another? That's not how we show our, our love for Jesus and that we are to be known for our love for one another and now we're grumbling against each other. We're dividing the church. James is like, there's no time for that. Don't you understand? The Lord's at the door. You better clean up the house now. You better get things ready now. You better get things in order because he's coming. Don't waste your time yelling at your your, your friend over there or or grumbling against somebody because you don't like the way they said something. No, you need to keep your focus where it matters. Establish your heart in the Lord. Care for those who are around you because he's close. Again, James is is writing close to 2,000 years ago, and our early brothers and sisters believed that the return of the Lord was going to come at any moment. And while we are closer than they were, uh, how close, we don't know. Not even Jesus says, I know the time or the hour. But we are to live knowing that he is at the door, that he is coming. And our lives should be lived in light of this. And there's a few different ways that we can view this, right? We can know that Jesus is close and we can be like, oh no, I'm not, I'm not ready for that. Or we can live in a way that's like, come Lord Jesus, yes, yes, Lord. And all those who are followers of Jesus, we can come before him knowing what he has accomplished in our lives and there's a joy and an expectancy that we are waiting for him. We cannot wait for him to come. And so there should be great joy and hope that gives us strength to patiently endure what we see around us. See, if you're a follower of Christ, this is good news. But if you're not a follower of Christ, the urgency of this moment cannot be overlooked. 
See, when Jesus, when Jesus came and, and took on human form and he walked this earth, he, he was very clear that he had come to seek and save the lost. And he's still patiently awaiting all who would come to him. But when he comes again, he would, he would judge. And all who are far from him will experience the full weight of their sin and separation from Christ. They will experience hell and all of its horrors. And so what James is reminding us of is like, don't grumble against one another. We've got work to do, important work to do. Don't waste your time. You're going to suffer. You're going to experience hardship. But when you do, don't waste your time blaming it on your brother or your sister. Don't waste your time speaking out against one another for our time is short. So let's make the most of it. So with the judge near the door, endure well, suffer well in patience. And then he continues and he says, let me give you some examples. Verse 10. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard the steadfastness of Job and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Now, if you know scripture and you've read the prophets, maybe we don't always take a lot of hope from them. We say, let's consider the example of them. It didn't work out great for all of them, but they patiently and expectantly endured. They continued to be a faithful witness to what the Lord had called them to. Jeremiah was put in stocks. He was thrown into a cistern. And yet he continued to proclaim what the Lord put in his heart and in his mind and continued to speak this truth because he couldn't do anything but that. It was this burning in his bones. It's the same way that when the Lord gets in us, when we experience and taste and see the goodness of who he is, he gets in our bones and we can't help but proclaim the goodness of that. And that's the hope that we cling to. That's the the way that we patiently endure even when things are hard because we know that he is coming again and we can walk forward in the strength of him. This is what James is reminding us of. So he says, "Think, think of the prophets who who continued and endured and remained steadfast. We consider them blessed because we know that whatever came against them could not overcome them because they were established in the Lord. That those who remain steadfast, we consider blessed because they endured. One author says it like this, steadfastness is the temper which does not easily succumb under suffering. Steadfastness is the temper which does not easily succumb under suffering. It's it's a strength in the midst of suffering. It's an endurance in the midst of hardship. And James speaks to the steadfastness of Job as this example of patient endurance. Job, who we read of his story, who lost so much, who experienced so much hardship. And we go, was he always patient? Because when we read the words of Job, he had some things to say to the Lord. He battled it out with the Lord. But in the same way, Job also refused to curse the Lord. In his pain, he acknowledged that it's the Lord who gives, it's the Lord who takes away, but I will continue to say, blessed be his name. This is the way in which Job endured. And as we see in in verse 11, if you, if you look there, it says, Behold, we consider those, who, those blessed who remain steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord. That word purpose there, tell us the end, the aim of the Lord. We have seen the aim of the Lord in Job's life. We've seen that the, the story did not end with just the demise of Job and the, the horrors that he experienced, no, but Job continued and lived and experienced the compassion and mercy of God. This was the the purpose, the aim of the Lord in the midst of this. So the end game of the Lord, how, how can we trust that? Well, James is reminding us of just who the Lord is. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. That's why we can trust in him even when things are hard. That's why we can trust in him even when things are coming against us. 
We can trust in his goodness. We can trust in his compassion and his mercy. And, and where do we hear that pairing? Where does that come from? Well, it takes us back to Exodus 34, 6, where the Lord declares his own character before Moses. And he's compassionate and he's, he's merciful. It's who he is. It's who he's always been. It's who he always will be. This is why we can have a patient expectancy as we wait upon the Lord. No matter how hard it is, and I'm not minimizing anything because we've all walked through some things in this room that we, we wish we hadn't, and yet we've seen the Lord step into those moments in, in a gracious and a compassionate way to give us strength to endure. And we hold tight to the hope that he will come and every tear will be wiped away. This is what James is bringing us back to in this moment. Let us live out this faith no matter how inconvenient it can feel at times to follow Jesus. It is always worth it is what he's reminding us of. Because God is, is in his goodness and his compassion and his, his mercy, he's modeled what patience looks like for us. This is why Peter says in 2 Peter 3, 9, he says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. What an incredibly profound thing to say. The Lord's not slow in his coming. He's patient towards humanity. He's patient towards us, not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So be patient, establish your hearts in him, endure. But Peter continues on in verse 10, right? He, he says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. And so we see just as James is reminding us of that the, the eminence of the Lord's return, that he's coming and he's, and he's gracious and he's compassionate, but we, we need to be ready because he's going to come unexpectedly. We're not, we're not going to see it coming. He's, he's going to be like a thief in the night when he returns. But as, as we experience life and the inconvenience of it, we remember that the Lord is not slow. The Lord is being patient towards you. He's being patient towards me. He's being patient towards us. He's being patient toward the world. And as James has been reminding us, if we believe this is true of him, if this is the character of God and we want to embody the character of God and live that out in our own lives, then patience should be the mark of every follower of Jesus. It's a, it's a fruit of, of living life in tune with the, the Spirit. That we should be patient until the coming of the Lord. Because as much as we should long for him to return, as much as we should long to be reunited with him, we should also rejoice that there's still more time for more to come to know him. That there's still more time for others to experience the hope that is found only in him. That there is still time for us to make much of Jesus that we may see heaven more crowded. And this is why James is telling us, be, be patient. He's not minimizing our life experience. He's just reminding, be patient. So how do we step into this? How do we begin to put flesh to this truth? Well, the, the first thing I think is obvious. is to be patient. Right? Just do it. Okay? Right? Be patient until the Lord comes. So if we're going to be patient until the Lord returns, or until you meet him in death, or you meet him in the sky, that means, again, as long as you have breath in your lungs, you're to endure, to be patient. You're to live with a patient expectation, that you are to pray fervently, it doesn't mean that we, we simply tolerate or we like everything that's happening around us, but, but in our patience, we endure and we live 
in the way of Jesus, even when it's hard, even when it's mocked, even when it's inconvenient. We endure the hardships that are set before us. We be patient, not just with ourselves, not just the world around us, but with our brothers and sisters as well. We don't grumble against them. We don't murmur under our breath. We don't hold things again. We, we, we be patient with one another. We extend the same grace towards others that we would hope they would extend towards us. And so we embrace the patience of God. But how do you, how do you practice patience? Someone once told me a good way to practice patience is whenever you get into a line, pick the longest one. And I was like, that's a terrible idea. (laughs) But but really, how do you how do you practice patience? I think there are moments like that where we, we willingly step into a line and we go, okay, Lord, I, I'm in such a hurry and I just, I'm really important and I need to get through this line faster than anybody else. Right? But what happens when we take some of that edge off and we just go, okay, I'm in no rush? Well, it opens our eyes. When our goal is not just to get to the fastest line so we can get out of there fast, suddenly we start to pay attention to the people around us and maybe you start to see some of the needs around you. You start to see the mom who's trying to get everything onto that little conveyor belt as their kid's running off and doing things, and you maybe have a little bit more compassion on what she's trying to experience in that moment. And instead of being like, can you keep your kid under control? Maybe you, you, you pray. Right? You start to th- see things different when you are patient. There is a lack of patience in the world around us. And if you can show up and be patient... Now, I'll I'll be honest with you. The Lord's going to have to do a work in my life, just as he's going to have to do work in your life, to help us to be patient, not to always be in such a rush, but to experience what's around us. Be patient until the coming of the Lord. Endure. Second thing is establish your heart. Root your heart in Jesus. Now, this may mean silencing some voices that are taking up too much space in your heart right now. When you start to feel yourself getting agitated by certain things, or you start to feel as though maybe Jesus has been bumped off his throne, then you're probably giving too much space in your heart to something else aside from him. So I don't know if that's, that's certain shows you, need to, you just need to mute for a little bit. Certain friends are always all riled up on, on ah, oh, it's the end of the world and everything. You know, I, I don't know what that is for you. But maybe you just need to, 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 to quiet some things. Maybe you just need to spend some extended time with the Lord and mark that and guard that. I had a chance this week to do just that, to just get away and be with the Lord. And I just was reminded how much I needed that extended time because there was other things that were trying to establish themselves in my heart and I just needed to give it back fully over to him. Say, Lord, there's things that are trying to crowd you out and I don't want any of that. Would you, would you just establish yourself in my heart? And maybe you just need to to take some extended time or maybe you just need to add some time in daily just to to root yourself, to establish yourself in the Lord. And, And the last thing I'd encourage you with is this. Remember the compassion and mercy of God. Remember the compassion and mercy of God. This one is so important. I stood at the edge of the the Truckee River and I just was taking in as, as the water was just kind of trickling along and it's just beautiful, rushing along. And as I sat there just kind of watching this scene play out, what really hit me was that it just was this endless stream. It just kept coming. It didn't stop. And as I was watching the water just flow by, I I began to just think of this very thing, that the compassion and mercy of God is like this river that is unending. And so often we view it as just this trickle. Like, can we just get a drop today? And he's like, I have so much. I have so much that is just pouring through. And maybe you're feeling at a place that you're just at a deficit and you just need to remember God's compassion and his mercy towards you. 
You just need to let that fill you and flow through you so that when you are walking through your life, you can extend compassion and mercy towards those around you. Because when it becomes real hard to extend compassion and mercy, that usually means you're running at a bit of a deficit. And so I'd encourage you to let him flow through you. Let him work through you. Let him fill you up. He, he's got enough. He's not going to run out. It's who he is. And so James reminds us in this moment to be patient. So be patient, my brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. For he is coming. And our hope is not in vain. So let us continue to watch. Let us establish our hearts in him and allow his compassion and his mercy to flow in and through us with a patient expectancy that he is coming. For whatever comes against us cannot overcome us when we are established in him. Amen? Amen. Amen. You pray with me. Father, as we, um, as we read these words, we pray that you would root them in our hearts, that you would establish them. God, there is so much to be distracted by. There is so much to, uh, to play into our fears, to play into our sense of control, there's so many things that we, we battle with. A world that is, is broken, God, and we see it. And we experience the frustration of that. But we also recognize, Lord, we also recognize that we too, those who were followers of you were, were broken, that we were lost until you, you moved in our lives. You called us to yourself and we found life and purpose in you. So God, would you help us to be patient? Would you help us not to, to rush ahead of you and try to fix things for you? But would you help us to trust that you are, are working? In the midst of the chaos, you can call forth order. You can do all things. And so would you help us to, to patiently and expectantly wait upon you to be active in our forbearance? Father, we can't do this unless our hearts are established in you, unless we're anchored and rooted in you. And so would you help us where we are establishing our hearts in something lesser than you, where we are rooting ourselves in something that is not of you, God, would you help us just to, to rid ourselves of that and to turn back towards you, to, to anchor ourselves completely and firmly in you, God. And Lord, would we remember your compassion and your mercy. Father, the truth that you are not slow in coming, but you are patiently awaiting that more can come to know you. You are so gracious. If the world around us grieves our hearts when we see the brokenness and the injustice, I cannot imagine how you see it. And yet, you still pursue us with a compassion and a mercy. And Lord, there will be a day when all is set right. And we cling to that hope, not passively, not sitting back, but continuing to actively move forward, following in the way of you, Jesus, here and now, no matter how hard it is. Patiently established in you, remembering your mercy, your compassion. God, would you, would you move in us? Would you speak to us? Would you, you calm our hearts where they need to be calmed? Would you reestablish yourself on the throne of our life if we've allowed something else to knock you off, God? For your promises are true. And your steadfast love endures forever. We love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.